That was beautiful. Well, thank you so much for letting me come and share a word with you this morning. As Matt said, we're uh, friends from many, many years ago. I'm now uh, chaplain at Walla Walla University, so far, far, far from here. But this feels like home to me. I'm from the southeast, went to school up the road. um, And my aunt was reminding me 17 years ago today, I did a baptism in Bear Lake with with Stefan. So um, if anyone else would like um, their child to be on the front row at church 17 years ago from today, talk to me afterwards, and I can work on making that happen. But it's good to be here with friends, good to be um, in what feels like home and to share a word. How many of you are at this time of the year beginning to reflect on how your year has gone and how your next year will go? Amen? Amen? It was at the beginning of this year that I was coming up with my thoughts. And you know, you come up with more general ideas. I want to be more organized in the new year. I want to be more kind in the new year. And then along the way, you come up with a few, a little bit more specific goals that you want to go for. You know, I want to lose four and a quarter pounds or whatever it is. I want to lose 44 and a quarter pounds, maybe. Um, and this year, I thought, you know what? I, I have run here and there uh, most of my life pretty consistently. And I said, you know, I want to come up with a running goal this year. And so I want to run the year. It's the year 2022. So I want to run 2,022 miles in the year. Comes out to, I don't know, around a little under 40 miles a week. And so, you know, I had to kind of do the math and figure that out. Started in January, started adding miles. You know, you start kind of slow and begin to <clears throat> build up. At first, you're kind of behind pace per week, uh, and so you have to kind of be ramping up. And by the time I got to the summer, I was doing way more than pace in order to catch back up, and I'd caught back up. And so by, you know, June, July, August, I'm well ahead of pace to run the year, run the miles of the year. And then, you know, you get to September, October, the weather is getting even better, and it's fantastic. I'm now far ahead of pace to run the year. November comes... And I don't know if you all have um, uh, respiratory ailments in Florida, but I received probably all of the respiratory ailments all at one time. The RSVs, the SARS-CoV-3s, you know, all of them, the serious ones. All at the same time, I was eventually diagnosed with pneumonia, and I was, I I couldn't run. I was running, uh, I was out of breath, I was... I felt terrible. I was wheezing, coughing, go to the doctor. And he says, well, you know you have pneumonia. I said, yes, but I'm having a hard time running. <laughs> he says, because you need to stop. You're doing irreparable damage to your lungs. It sounds like a, like a smoke factory in your lungs. You need to stop. And so I had to stop. I had miles built in the bank, of course, because I'd run ahead of schedule. And, and, and those began to deplete. Um, in my world of uh, obsession, I have Excel spreadsheets that track all of this. And I could see those miles begin to deplete and go lower and lower until finally I was in the negative. And, and fast forward to yesterday, last time I checked, I was at 1,929 miles for the year. Technically, it's still possible. <laughs> the math would go something like this. If you just, if you do your, if my calculator app works appropriately, it goes something like this. Assuming we get done here in a little bit, we go home, we have potluck, assuming the haystacks end around 1.30, a little tecito, cafecito, until about 1.45, 1.50. Assuming I stretch and I'm running by two, that's 10 hours until midnight, about 93 miles left, 9.3 miles per hour at a 60 minutes per mile. It comes out to a six flat mile till midnight. It's technically still possible, pragmatically infeasible. And I began to think about how many other areas of our lives, as I slowly let this one go, How many things in our lives are similar that they're practically possible but pragmatically infeasible? How many things in your life feel like, yeah, I mean, technically speaking, that's possible, 
someone is like, well, you know, if you want to if you want a promotion to work, you just got to get that PhD. And you're like, that is possible. That's infeasible. How many of our relationships and the way that we are as people in our own lives, as our own self-actualization, as improved humans, be better, be more forgiving, be kinder. And we think to ourselves, this is practically possible, pragmatically infeasible. I don't feel like I can just will myself to be this way more. I begin to think of beyond all of the areas into the the further realm of what we feel is even at our control. We begin to think of all of the relationships that we wish were better. The people in our lives that we love, that we wish were more successful in their own lives, we have very little control there. People that we wish we could see at church people that we wish were doing well in their marriages, people that we wish were successful in their own development, and it's possible, right? Maybe we could say just the right word, send them just the right quote, send them just the right Bible verse. It's possible, but it feels infeasible. This morning I'm thinking of a story, a story that we're all familiar with, that I thought we might reflect on for a few moments that has these kind of dynamics that feel possible but play out as infeasible. The story of Joseph, a story that we're all familiar with. It's a beautiful story. And this story begins with dysfunctional relationships right at the core. I'll put this on the screen for you. It says that now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age and from his favorite wife. And he made an ornate robe And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. And here begins one of the saddest, most twisted, most dynamic tales in the Old Testament. Joseph, beloved by his father, the the most special in his father's eyes, and at the heart of this extended large family, rotten, painful, Jealous dysfunctionality begins to tear away at the binds in this family. Can we get an amen, or maybe we should do hands raised for any family here that is familiar with dysfunctionality at the heart of their family. Let's get hands, hi, hi, hi. No, I'm just joking, put your hands down, quickly. <laughs> quickly, quickly, we're all related here. We're all, I've been here before, we're all related, it's fine. We know something of dysfunctionality possibly in this room, maybe, just one or two of us, if you're similar to me, one or two of us are familiar with dysfunctionality. And here, at the heart of this Joseph story is dysfunctionality. People functioning with insecurity, a desire for the appeal and interest of their father. Fathers with misplaced attention and compassion. This is a family not unlike anyone in this room that has its own dynamics and its own challenges, but this begins to fester and rot into something truly ugly. Over time, we're familiar with the story, these brothers would become enraged. Their insecurities and their doubts and their resentments would blossom into something truly wicked until the day comes that Joseph would arrive at where their brothers are encamped and they would say, we must take his life. This seer, this dreamer, comes up with dreams foretelling when he'll be over us. Get out of here. There's no way. Maybe if we just get rid of him, we don't have to think of these things anymore. And so rather than buy him a one ticket in one direction, one way ticket somewhere else, they devise a crime, an awful crime. They attack him, they bind him, steal his robe, an act of hatred to minimize his stature within the family and to shame him, removing the representation of his father's affection, and they toss him in a well, sell him for silver to passing traders, and off he goes to Egypt. What happens next over the course of Genesis chapter 37 to 50, you can read on your own, it'd be the content for another five or six sermons, but what happens is Joseph arrives there at just the right time, He is taken from prison into the household of an elite leader in the nation of of Egypt. 
He is falsely accused, sent back to prison where he's imprisoned with other foreigners that are also falsely accused. He arises eventually back into a claim, comes into a place of power at just the right time, and God uses him for a very special purpose. Eventually, famine strikes the land exactly as Joseph had predicted. The seer has seen things and they do come to pass. And so we slow the story back down at a moment where famine has now arrived just as Joseph predicted, and this famine is terribly affecting the land. In fact, archaeologists have found evidences of a famine here in the second millennia BC that marks very similar characteristics to what we're reading in scripture here. And you can imagine that a famine in an agrarian culture would hit hardest the kind of people that rely on rain. Now, what kind of culture in this region might not be reliant on rain? Maybe a group of people that relies on a river. And so Egypt, benefiting from the Nile going through their area, is able to defeat this famine in a very unique way, and all of the world is very, very, very interested in the kind of support and aid that Egypt might be able to provide in this moment of famine. And who sits at the linchpin, pivotal position of this need is Joseph, having been placed in a, in a position where he's to administer the aid in the time of this famine. We pick up the story in Genesis uh, 41, where it says, and all of the world now comes to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. And everywhere includes the household where Joseph was raised. His old brothers, his old sisters and aunts and uncles, and his very household is now facing the same famine. You can imagine now Jacob in his old age begins to brainstorm how he can provide in this moment of need for all of the families that are dependent upon him in this time. And so he begins to brainstorm, well, I've heard about Egypt. I've heard what Egypt has going on. I've heard Egypt has options for this moment. Have you heard Egypt might have storehouses of food? For those of you that have hidden mistakes in your heart, unresolved mistakes for decades, maybe you might be able to resonate with the brothers with what they've been hiding when they begin to hear their father Jacob use the word Egypt out loud in their tents. Jacob begins to talk about Egypt, 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 and the brothers say, quit saying that. Why do you keep saying that? We don't want to talk about Egypt in this household. He says, but Egypt, Egypt might have some food, some Egyptian food, some good Egypt food. And they're saying, this is a problem. We know it's a problem because we get this hint in the very next verse at the beginning of Genesis chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he says to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? There is discomfort when we have unresolved trauma. There is discomfort when we have unresolved emotional friction in our lives. And it clouds us in our ability to be able to step forward and bring resolution to the needs of our moment. You can't be a healthy leader in your household and you can't be a healthy provider in your community when there are things in your life that hamper your ability to see clearly. When we walk as people with unresolved emotional trauma in our lives, we are missing half of the options available to us to provide solutions. They don't want to hear anything about what Egypt might be able to do for their moment because Egypt represents pain and trauma and they don't want to deal with pain and trauma. Jacob is not hung up in such ways and he says, y'all need to go to Egypt. You see, when we begin to think of this moment and we begin to see of the kind of shenanigans taken out by these brothers and we begin to reflect on the story of Joseph for our moment, some of you, if you're anything like me, might be tempted just for a moment 
as you begin to reflect and associate and identify with characters in this story, to begin to think that you might identify, if you're anything like me, and I'm sure there's only one or two of those, that you might begin to think that, man, who would I identify with in this story? All of God's word is spirit-breathed to give us as a mirror and a guide for our daily living. Amen? So if God's word is given as a mirror and a guide for my daily living, then who mirrors me in this story? And if you're anything like me, you might look at the characters in this story and say, well, I recognize people in this story that are overcomers, people that stand for right though the heavens fall, people that are overcomers, people that have been attacked, people that have been persecuted, people that have been falsely accused, people that are singularly focused and stand up for right in the moment they need to, I might identify with Joseph. Let me put those two categories up on the screen for you because these are kind of the two different things that you could identify with. You could say, I'm a Joseph in this story or I'm the brothers in this story. Again, there might be one or two of you that walk with me and see yourself maybe in the story of Joseph. But as we break down the kind of characteristics we see in the story of Joseph, we might look at them something like this. Um, He's the beloved son of the father. He's rejected by his own people. He's bound and sold for silver. He's stripped of his clothing. He goes from exalted status to slave status. He's wrongfully condemned. He overcomes and he saves his people. He extends extraordinary forgiveness. Does that sound familiar like anyone you know? Amen. Amen. Do they amen here, Matt? (laughs) Now we might want to look at the characteristics of the brothers, something that would go maybe something like this. They're jealous and insecure. They're wicked and petty. They believe that the means justify the ends. They're liars. They live in shame. They're They're unable to provide even basic provisions for the families that depend upon them. They're desperate and they're in need of grace. Does that sound like anyone you know? I regret to inform you that I might be closer to the second group than the former. And that's the challenge with us. As we begin to look at a story like this, as we begin to see that in this story there are mirrors to be held up to us as we desire to be everything that God wants us to be, but oftentimes we're in the sadder category, we're in the latter category rather than in the former. We're the ones that live our lives bouncing from jealousy to insecurity, from pettiness to, to deception, considering that our, the, the, the means will justify the ends, unable to provide even basic, healthy, emotional leadership within our own homes. And we begin to realize that maybe, maybe I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Maybe the shenanigans of the brothers in this story represent something of a mirror to my own story. Maybe not just 2022, but much longer. You see, when we begin to consider what it is God wants us to be, something that we think for just a couple of seconds about at the end of every calendar year, but maybe we should consider more often, we become faced with this kind of challenge. We're far from where God intends for his people to be. We're not where we wish we could be, nor are we where we believe God's will wishes we were. You see, this story continues, and it goes something like this. It twists and turns, and eventually Joseph has a dramatic revealing of his identity to the brothers as they come to get help from Egypt. We need what you have, and Joseph is like, I'm your brother, and they're like, that's crazy. And there's this dramatic revelation moment, and everything's fine for a minute. They bring Jacob to Egypt, and the family is reunited, but then Jacob dies, And the brothers are gripped with panic because they say, now Joseph's can truly enact revenge the way we're certain he wants because dad is gone and now he's going to do what he's been wanting to do the whole time. And Joseph senses their fear and he gives this climactic and dramatic assurance. He says to them, Genesis 50, My brothers, you intended harm for me, 
But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God had a plan, and you had a plan, and it didn't work out maybe how we thought it was going to work out. You intended harm, but God intended it for good. You intended evil, but God made it work for good. And many of us can look in a mirror and see how many times we have made mistakes, we have made decisions that expressly intended evil in our own lives. And we look on other people's lives and we see them making decisions that lead to evil in their own lives, that lead to hurt and pain and sorrow in their lives. And we know that mirror is telling us that we repeatedly do the same in our own lives. But God intends it for good. You see, we have to ask them the question, what is going on with God's will? Because it doesn't feel like we're experiencing God's will here today. When's the last time you turned on the news? Does that look like a representation of God's will? Have you scrolled the timeline recently? Does that look like a representation of what God wants on this planet? There's a gap between what God intends and what we experience. So maybe it might be helpful to take a primer on what God intends for this world at all. Genesis chapter one says something like this, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the earth. From the outset, God says, I want the world to have something of my image, my character, in the way that the world looks. That's at the beginning of time, but I could take you even before the beginning of time. Go back to John chapter 17, Jesus praying, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Before time, before the beginning of the world, God was love. Before God created you and me, God was already in a loving relationship with God's self. God, there was no moment in time when God was not in love and expressing of love. Ephesians 1, 4, just as God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, now there's a second piece that maybe God has not only been loving, but God has been planning something for you and me long before we were ever in awareness of God's existence. And so when we fast forward to the story of the nativity, God speaks this prophecy about the express purpose of Jesus when he says in Matthew 1, she will bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. God exists to love, God has forechosen you, and God arrives on this earth with the express intent of saving you and me. Hallelujah. That's what God exists for. We know the supreme will of God, it is to save. Luke 19, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is the ultimate will of God. But does God always get what God wants? A few years ago, about a year and a half ago, on a college campus, like I said, I'm the chaplain at Walla Walla University. I I love engaging in, in, in dialogue and conversation with my students. I put out a poll for our students um, and I asked them this question. I'll put it up on the screen. They had two choices. The idea of meaningful choice is an illusion. The future is set. Number two, the future is flexible. Our daily decisions can change the future. Those are the two options. You want to see the results? Here's what our campus, um, the 500 or so students that responded to my poll, 490 said the future is flexible. 16 said the idea of meaningful choice is an illusion. I'm not really sure, you know, whether it's worthy to, you know, quibble with my framing there. I probably goosed the results a little bit with the way that I framed the question. But it's an interesting question. Because see, if I were to take all of our theology in this room, 
from whatever tradition you come from, maybe Seventh-day Adventist, Christian, mainline, some other, maybe questioning, I imagine we could come up with possibly four primary categories of our theology, and it would go something like this. God is omnibenevolent. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. There is evil in the world. Right, that would describe the majority of all of our worldviews at this time, right? The challenge is, is that it's very difficult to have that first one. Let me highlight it. God is omnibenevolent. It's very difficult to have that as a part of our theological systematics while at the same time making space for evil. How can an all-loving God, how can an omnibenevolent God make space for this kind of heartache, for this gap between what he intends and what we experience? Because there is a gap and every person arrives at this room with their own bruises related to that gap in their lives between what God wants and what we have. Maybe we could reword that omnibenevolent to something like, God is pure love. You see, because when you come to anything, creating a taxonomy of our beliefs, a, a, a theological a system to approach what we believe, there has to be a sense where we begin where God says of himself we should begin. What does God say of himself? God is, God is love. God doesn't begin with God is knowing. God doesn't say God is all powerful. Those things are a part of his character. Those things are a part of his description, but he begins by self-identifying as love. So we must begin in the same place and say, well, if God is love, then what does it look like for God to treat people with love? Love requires something incredibly dangerous. Love requires risk. There has to be a choice in a relationship built with love. You can't just simply force someone to love you. They have to choose it, and that choice represents risk. And so when God introduces risk into the relationship that he might have love that represents his character, that brings chaos. But it's a chaos that's incredibly important. C.S. Lewis says this, a world of automata, of creatures that work like machines would hardly be worth creating. The happiness which God designs for his creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight beyond the most rapturous love between a man and a woman, and for that they must be free. You see, God wants our minds to be free. God wants us to consciously, with clear thought, choose a relationship with him, but our minds can't even do that much. Romans 8, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not submit to God's law. In fact, it can't. Our minds can't even do the thing that we wish they would. Romans 5, for very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a really good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or I might put it like this from the message. For God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use to him. Risk. Born of a choice, brought about by love. You see, when we enter into this messy, chaotic world, we are in a world that exists as the object of God's love. And that love brought about a very important choice, which assumes risk, which introduces chaos, which means that God does not always get what God wants because what God wants most of all is you. And you're not you unless you can choose. And so we have a story where not only were the brothers intending harm, but you and I intend harm for ourselves. We make decisions that are not in our best interest, and our loved ones make decisions that are not in their best interest. And all throughout that, a constant is the relentless love of Jesus Christ. A love that existed before the beginning of time and has arced throughout history and a relentless pursuit of you and the people that you love. Because for every person in this room, 
There are spaces in the pews for the people that we wish were in this room, that we wish were in a relationship with Jesus, that we wish were not making decisions that harmed themselves and others. And we might be some of those people ourselves. I'm going to skip down to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your, your fruit should abide. That idea where Joseph looks at his brothers and says, you intended harm and you've lived harm on your own lives over and over and over again, but God intended it for good. We can relate with that kind of gap between what God wills and what we get. But the constant is the relentless pursuit of Jesus that is acting on your life whether you care or not. God is pursuing you whether you're interested or not. And God does the same for the people that we care about. A couple of years ago, I had a young student come to my office. And as chaplain, I love these kinds of conversations. I want to ask you some questions about theology. I mean, at first, you know, I get a little nervous, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, have all the right answers. And, you know, over time you learn, you just need to listen. And I sat there and this student began to ask questions. Well, I want to know about the Sabbath. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I came here on a, you know, scholarship for something else. And, and I, now I want to know, what is it with this Sabbath? I go to get something in Friday afternoon and everything's closed on campus. What is going on? What is wrong with you people? Um, and we laughed and we began to talk about it a little bit. I said, well, tell me a little bit more about your story. And they said, well, come to, they said, over time, I've been here now, I'm a sophomore. Over time, my roommate and I, also somebody that's not from this particular community, not from this faith tradition, we began to see that nobody else was studying on, on Sabbath, so maybe we are going to forego studying on Sabbath. And nobody else was stressed about schoolwork on Sabbath, and nobody else was doing these different, so maybe we would put the books up on a shelf on Sabbath. And I'm listening to all of this, and I'm, I'm just amazed. I mean, this is the stuff you hear on the mission stories. I'm just listening to all of this. And so she said, and we began to keep the Sabbath, but we don't know what it means. And I said, well, tell me a little bit more about it. And so we began to study the Bible. Again, I'm not, I haven't even said anything. I haven't even opened my mouth. I'm just listening. I'm going, I'm doing these kind of, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm just, I'm just taking in, as I'm witnessing this, this young lady begin to tell me what she learned as her and her roommate began. I said, did you hear this from one of your teachers? No, we began to look this stuff up. I said, and, and tell me more. And, and, and your parents, oh, non-Christian. They hate all this stuff. Okay, well, tell me more. And, and then we began to read and study, and now we've grown a deep, deep appreciation for the Sabbath, and we're Sabbath keepers. And I'm, I, again, I have not said anything. And they said, and I, I came to you, I, I guess, I said, well, what can I help you with? Oh, I want to be baptized. I, w- I want to be, I said, well, let's, you know, in good form, I said, well, let me throw obstacles in your way. Um, and so I said, well, let's begin studying the Bible. Uh, that was sarcasm. And so I, we began to study the Bible, and then this was about February of 2020. March, some things went down, and we were separated then for about another year. I just didn't hear from her. I send her an email, and I say, hey, um, hope you're doing well, praying for you. Um, haven't heard from you, and I think it was this time last year, and I sent the email. Reply back. Immediately, an appointment shows up in my, um, in my calendar, and I get an email with all of the exclamation points. I didn't say a lot. I said all of the exclamation points, saying, you can't believe how important it is that I got this email today. I, can I come and see you? And I saw that there was already, an, that my assistant already put an appointment on my calendar, and so I said, absolutely, let's come in. And so we sit there, all of this more stuff. I've, I've I've fo- begun following Jesus and he's every part of my life and I don't want to do anything else apart from Jesus and Jesus this and Jesus that. Jesus is such a central part of my life. When can we be baptized? And I said, well, it's near the end of the school year. I want to be baptized before we leave this school year. And it was within a couple of weeks that we were standing in the baptistry beginning a life with Jesus and her baptism was so beautiful. 
And I began to think through each of those moments, what it was that I had said that had done the right thing, that I had done that was the right thing, what kind of perfect answer I'd given that was just right, and it was nothing. I had done nothing. I had done more harm than good throughout the process, but God intended it for good all along the way. And each of us come here because we're upset with ourselves with all the mistakes that we've made that have caused harm in our own lives. And we're worried about doing anything in the lives of those that we love because we don't want to do, we don't want to push her away. We don't want to push him away. I don't want to talk about any of this stuff because I don't want want to hurt them. And we forget that apart from anything that we're doing, that apart that anything that the brothers were doing, apart from anything that Joseph was doing, in the background, a wind was blowing of a savior who at his core was love and who was at his very identity a seeking and searching savior sent to save each and every one of us. And whether you care or not, and whether you're interested or not, God loves you more than you can ever imagine. And whether you're loved ones care or not, or are interested or not, or are aware enough, God loves them more than you can ever imagine. And that wind is blowing over their lives, and God is calling you and I to step into that wind and be a part of what he's already been doing since before the beginning of time. What we intend for harm, hallelujah, God, It intends for good, and he's been at the saving work long before you or I ever cared, knew, or were aware. Praise Jesus. Have a word of prayer with me. God in heaven, Lord, what are we doing here? You've been at our lives, you've been involved in our lives, and you've been loving our lives long before we ever knew you existed. So God, we want to step into that wind We want to feel that love, and Lord, we want to make sure that that love is felt amongst those those important people in our lives. Lord, may we begin this year in a renewed and special awareness of what you're already doing. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.